He was the king of a tiny kingdom. He was barely 20 when he embarked on fulfilling the longest held dream in history, that of uniting the East and the West. A political and military genius, he conquered the greatest empire of the time, which extended up to the borders of India. In 13 years, he imposed a new vision of the world. That was 2,300 years ago. His name, Alexander the Great. The Acropolis, bathed in Mediterranean light and the ultimate demonstration of beauty for the Greeks, has been calling out to Athens and the world for thousands of years. Alexander the Great, who contributed to the influence of Hellenism, was not even a citizen of the city. Yet, each summer, at the foot of this rock, children gaze with fascination at shadow puppet shows inspired by legends about him. including one legend in which, after a long fight, he saw off a gigantic python that was terrorizing the inhabitants. From the Atlantic to the Pacific, his exploits have permeated the culture and the collective memory of many civilizations. The man, the soldier, and the politician gazes far into the future, as if he were dreaming. He arrived on the world stage in 356 BC in Macedonia, 500 kilometers from Athens, which was then the capital of ancient Greece. He was born in Pella, north of Mount Olympus, the chosen land of the gods. This valley has always been dedicated to horses, and its current inhabitants could well be the descendants of Alexander and his cavalrymen. At birth, this son of a king received the kingdom of Macedonia from his father, Philip II. Philip had united a Greek world devastated by intercity wars. It was a world of amazing artistic and intellectual richness, radiating intelligence and beauty that would give birth to Western civilization. The kingdom was small, and Alexander's ambition immense. Having inherited the spirit of his father, he succeeded in spreading Greek thinking far and wide. His genius was underpinned by brilliant strategic and political intuition. These simple soldiers feasting with nobles provide one of the keys to Alexander's military superiority. At a time when professional armies did not exist, he formed a permanent army with veritable professional troops. This offered a considerable advantage over his enemies, who would arm peasants, who would then return to their harvest when the war was over. However, this fresco reveals another aspect of his soldiers, the immense size of their spears, the famous sarissas. It was not only that they were longer than those of their enemies, but also the way Alexander and his father chose to handle them in close fights, which provided Greek warriors with a definite advantage.
Professor Minor Markle has reconstructed the way in which the Macedonian infantry used the famous sarissas. The demonstration is performed with spears identical to those used in antiquity. They are five and a half meters long and weigh 6.2 kilos. That's good. Parallel with the ground. That's very good. Uh, no, I can't. It's slow to move from side to side. It's, um, it's easy to maintain it here, but any movement becomes difficult. To ensure greater mobility, Alexander's father equipped his infantry with sarissas, which enabled them to lighten the weight of their heavy bronze shields. Now in ancient times, the, the sarissa arm phalanx first became possible when, when Philip, the father of Alexander the Great, de developed a professional infantry, that is, men who could serve 12 months of the year for pay, uh, so that they could be fully trained, because so to use the sarissa properly it requires very careful training. Left, left, left, left. The troops were formed into phalanxes of 50 soldiers. This idea would later inspire Roman strategy. It's important that the first four ranks, ranks one, two, three, and four, all hold their sarissas level so that each of them projects beyond the front rank. And then the rear ranks hold theirs diagonally into the air until uh, the person in front is killed, and then, the, then they will move forward and lower their sarissa. Well, it was strong because the enemy were faced with a whole hedge of, of bristling points in the forward section of the, uh, of the phalanx, so that was very intimidating to the enemy and very deadly if they had no gaps occurring in the line. With its professional infantry, sarissas, and complete mastery of a new combat strategy, Alexander had a decisive military device at his disposal. All that remained was to embark on a campaign. This mosaic represents the young Alexander about to attack a lion. As an adolescent, he apparently managed to single-handedly tame Bucephalus, a wild horse that, along with Alexander, would become legendary. The philosopher Aristotle was responsible for teaching him the unique Greek way of thinking that had been developing intellectually for over three centuries. For the Greeks, the entire world was limited to Greece, Egypt and Asia, at whose borders India was located. Alexander was convinced that he had to spread the same way of thinking to all habitable lands and to all fellow citizens of the same state and government. In a word, he felt he was responsible for taking Greek civilization to the most remote lands. Before embarking on this enterprise, he decided to consolidate his power inherited from his father. He united around him the Greek cities being threatened by Persian expansionism and weakened by divisions. These cities were also scattered over a large area and were therefore vulnerable. Convinced by his vision, these cities entrusted him to liberate their sister cities in Asia Minor, which at that time was under Persian rule. During this period in history, the majority of Asia was under the influence of the powerful Persian Empire. In keeping with this vast territory, everything was on a gigantic scale. This statue representing Lamassu, a winged bull with a man's head, is seven meters tall. It appears to guard Persepolis, the capital of the empire a place that was the subject of both fear and fascination for the small Greek cities. This monumental staircase leading up to Apandana Palace is also impressive and was large enough to accommodate 100,000 people, without including the 10,000 immortals that formed the imperial guard of the sovereign. The system of government was an autocratic one, very different from democratic Greece. Darius III, an absolute monarch, and the king of kings, ruled over his empire with an iron fist. His power lay in the richness of his vassals, the 23 provinces of the Persian Empire. These included the Scythians, formidable nomad warriors that formed his cavalry. India supplied his gold. 
Ethiopia is ivory. The Persian Empire still had to conquer Greece, which it had always coveted and was a real obsession for Darius. The Persians had twice unsuccessfully tried to invade Greece. The Greeks, for their part, wanted to retaliate in memory of the Greek cities of Asia Minor, the present-day Turkey, which had fallen into the hands of the Persians. They despised the Persians, who they compared to centaurs, half-man, half-horse creatures, that represented in Greek imagination a man not fully released from his animal origins. Alexander's appeal was received with fervor throughout the Greek world, and he was able to embark on one of the most dazzling adventures ever envisaged by man. It would turn him into a demigod. Our knowledge of the awe-inspiring cavalcade comes via the Anabasis, an account given by a chronicler from the 2nd century AD, the Greek historian Arian. He was inspired by the reports delivered by Alexander's generals. Arian related, perhaps somewhat complacently, the conquests of Alexander. He credited him with the desire to abolish oligarchy in order to install democracy. The mythical epic started in the spring of 334. Alexander crossed the Dardanelles, separating Europe from Asia with 180 ships. The famous strait was guarded by Troy, the city where Achilles died. Brought up on the Iliad and the Odyssey, Alexander knelt at his tomb. The campaign to liberate the Greek cities could begin. He advanced with 37,000 men to the banks of the Granicus. The Persian army was waiting for him on the other side of the river. This was Alexander's first major battle. The Day of Reckoning was in May 334. The Persians expected his infantry to cross the river and expose themselves to their arrows. He decided to surprise them by charging the cavalry. The impetuous nature of the charge disconcerted the enemy and caused confusion in their ranks. After managing to cross the river under the onslaught of the arrows of the enemy archers, Alexander penetrated the enemy lines. In the melee, he narrowly escaped death. For a long time, the outcome of the battle was unclear. However, the Persians, who had retreated to the foot of the hills, abandoned the battlefield. With this initial victory, the Greeks gained possession of Ionia, the present-day Anatolia, which opened up the major routes to Asia Minor. As Alexander penetrated even further and conquered even more land, bit by bit, he discovered a world far different from the ideas he had received in Greece. He encountered populations with levels of refinement unknown to the Greeks. He questioned whether this empire was the barbarian world that he had learned about. His intuition was that the Persian Empire depended on something other than mere force. Tomris Bakir is heading the dig at the Turkish site of Daskilium, the seat of the Persian government in the region. She believes that it was probably here that Alexander discovered the existence of a new system the Persians used for communications and exchanges. It was an extensive network linking the entire region to Persepolis, the capital of the empire. The system was based on the use of a seal affixed to letters to seal them and authenticate the sender. Several hundred seals were found in the ruins of Daskilium. Burada yapılan kazılarda ele geçen 500 adet bulla, yani mühür baskısı, Daskilayon'un İran'daki merkez Persepolis'le olan bağlantısını göstermesi açısından ve bullaların Daskilayon'daki bir saray arşivinde ele geçmiş olması bakımından çok büyük önem taşıyor. Efficiently governing the immense Persian Empire and its 23 provinces required an efficient system of communications, correspondence and exchanges. It also required an efficient administration. In each province, a satrap, a representative of the king, was the embodiment of authority. 
The monarch was informed of a range of issues varying from the taxes collected and the laws applied, but also about the state and the spirit of the population. 2,400 kilometers separated the capital of the empire from the most westerly city. Legend has it that post horses covered this distance in around 10 days. The Royal Road, which extended up to Susa, was dotted every 30 kilometers with coaching inns. Alexander was impressed by the extent of this network, unequaled in Greece. In pursuit of his dream, Alexander headed southeast. He had an historic appointment with Darius, who he was to confront in person for the first time. Darius was waiting for him, with, according to the Chronicle, an army of 500,000 men at Isos. At the end of the battle, Darius deserted the battlefield, leaving his wife, children and mother to be captured. In return for their release, the Persian king offered half of his empire. Alexander refused. He wanted everything. He seized the campaign treasure of his enemy, his bow, chariot, and even his cloak. However, Darius did not believe he was vanquished. He still held virtually the entire empire that stretched from the Euphrates to the Indus. An obstacle had been lifted, and Phoenicia and Egypt, which were ruled by Persia at that time, were now within Alexander's grasp. In the two years following his arrival in Asia, Alexander conquered around 60 cities. As if drawn by a magnet, Alexander prepared for an appointment with the Egyptian civilization and its pyramids, over 3,000 years old. At the foot of the pyramids, he received a formidable lesson in politics, discovering how the Persians governed enslaved countries. He noted, in fact, that Darius, who was venerated as a pharaoh, had allowed the Egyptians to practice their religion and had displayed a profound respect for their language and culture. Alexander was also fascinated by the way that the Persians had enhanced this arid land. The Sahara surrounds the inhabited parts of Egypt. The French archaeologist Michel Woodman is leading the excavations in the ruins of Ayn Man Weir. About 12 years ago, excavations in the waterways revealed a system of capturing and diverting water, dating back to the period of Persian rule in Egypt. In the first site excavated, over an area of several kilometers, vertical wells were revealed, separated by distances of 15 meters. At the bottom of the wells, Dr. Woodman discovered a gallery, approximately 60 centimeters wide, dug into the rock at a depth of nine meters. Nous sommes dans une partie drainante de la Canade, c'est-à-dire une partie où l'eau suinte euh, du réservoir, qui est le grès, est, euh, est rassemblée dans le fond de la galerie. Cette eau est collectée sur toute la longueur et euh, s'achemine par la pente euh, très faible du tunnel vers la sortie. Elles sont creusées à l'époque de la domination perse en Égypte. Ce sont à l'heure actuelle les seules dont on peut dater le creusement. Alors évidemment, euh, franchir le pas pour dire que c'est une technique importée du monde iranien, cela paraît logique, cela paraît probable, mais évidemment, euh, il manque un maillon pour établir définitivement ce fait. This technique is still used in Iran, in the desert province of Yazdi, 2,400 kilometers to the east of the Egyptian site. The top of the well is perfectly visible. The underground sources run along these canats.
The canal is designed on a slight slope to enable the water to be distributed over the greatest area possible. It was a gigantic hydraulic system with a series of wells that linked underground canals running from the mountains to the farms in the plains. After traveling 50 kilometers underground, the water remains fresh, despite temperatures in the region that exceed 45 degrees. This system provides a supply of water protected from evaporation. A single canat can irrigate up to 30 hectares of farmable land. This system is no doubt inherited from the know-how of the Persian Empire. Michel Woodman, in any event, believes this is the case. Le temple de Ayn Manor a été découvert presque par hasard en 1993 par des balayages de surface sous des tas de céramique d'époque romaine. La fouille de ce temple a livré du mobilier, parmi ce mobilier des ostracas, qui se sont révélés être des contrats, des contrats qui portaient des dates, et euh, voilà qui nous transportaient à l'époque de la première domination perse en Égypte, depuis euh, le règne de Darius jusqu'à la fin de cette domination, voire même un peu au-delà. Il faut imaginer tout le bas de la colline, toute cette zone, il faut l'imaginer verte, verte de jardin, verte de champs, euh, verte d'arbres, de palmiers, de sycomores, de perséas, tout type d'arbres mentionnés dans les textes qui nous sont parvenus. Un développement aussi rapide dans une région qui était vide nous fait supposer qu'il y a quelque part euh, une planification et vraisemblablement du pouvoir central. Parmi les hypothèses que l'on peut retenir, c'est une mise en valeur pour, euh, je ne pourrais dire, collecter des impôts, collecter des revenus, faire de ces oasis une région exportatrice vers le reste de l'Égypte ou de l'Empire, on n'en sait rien. When Alexander arrived in Egypt, he visited the sanctuary of Amun. He respectfully entered the temple without his generals. The priests recognized him as the son of a god and predicted that he would become a reconciliatory force and the governor of the earth. He then became a pharaoh. He is being depicted in this temple in Luxor, the sacred city of ancient Egypt. In common with his predecessor, he continued the policy of tolerance as he understood that he would never govern Egypt without the agreement of its population. His idea of royalty had been transformed. <laughs> Alexander decided to settle the situation with Darius once and for all and set off after the Persian emperor, who had raised an immense army that carried with it the last hopes of the empire. Alexander crossed Phoenicia, traveled north of Syria, and became more and more resolute. He crossed over the Euphrates and the Tigris on the 20th of September, 331, a night of an eclipse, and camped in Guagamela. The two sovereigns prepared themselves for the final battle. Darius's army was camped in the plain of Guagamela in Iraq. According to legend, it included a million warriors from the present-day India, Central Asia, and the rim of the Persian Gulf. For ten days, the enemies observed each other. On the morning of the 1st of October, the battle commenced. For Darius, who was personally leading his troops, the stakes were crucial. If he lost, another obstacle would be removed from the road to Babylon and Persepolis, his capital. As far as Alexander was concerned, he was determined to settle the matter once and for all. He was determined to capture the King of Kings. At his command, the Greek vanguard attacked the Scythian cavalry. It managed to rapidly neutralize the enemy Scythian chariots. 
Darius replied by detaching units from the center to support the wing under attack, which opened up a dangerous breach in the front line. At the same time, the right wing of his cavalry attacked the Macedonian flank in an attempt to overwhelm it. Alexander surged into the breach and the Persian front line dispersed. The violence of the charge was amazing and it wiped out the heart of the Persian army. No resistance seemed able to halt the frenzy of Alexander's troops. Darius realized the extent of the defeat, and feeling under threat, he withdrew. His personal guard regrouped to protect his retreat. When the majority of the Persian troops learned about the flight of the king, panic ensued. The entire Persian Empire was now within the reach of the Macedonian king. One world was finishing. Would another one begin? The conqueror of Darius now directed his attention towards the Euphrates, the birthplace of the Mesopotamian civilization, and to Babylon in particular. Babylon was the first oriental metropolitan area conquered by the Greeks. On hearing the news, the people in the east were stunned. Alexander triumphantly walked along the sacred way that led to the monumental ceramic Ishtar Gate. He was welcomed by one of the generals he had fought against, who handed him the keys to the royal treasure. The beauty of Babylon astounded the 47,000 members of Alexander's phalanxes. Colossal friezes depicting a procession of lions, bulls, and strange beasts covered the walls of the city. Amazed, they visited the terraced hanging gardens, where a lifting device ensured the correct height for watering. They also discovered the square tower of Bell. The wonders displayed before them were one of the seven wonders of the world. The declaration sent by Alexander to the inhabitants of Babylon at the time of entering into the city has been found. In Babylon, important events were noted down on clay tablets in cuneiform writing. These tablets were deciphered by Christopher Walker and are kept at the British Museum. This line on the tablet contains Alexander's declaration made to the people of Babylon before he entered the city, I shall not enter your houses. We suspect again this is some kind of political propaganda. There is a story from much earlier times when the Persian king Cyrus captured Babylon at the time of Nabonidus, that after he had entered Babylon, he issued a declaration that all the citizens of Babylon must surrender their weapons. And after that, the houses were searched in any house that was found to contain weapons, all of its occupants were put to death. Alexander's declaration seems to be something like a promise that this kind of treatment will not be given to the Babylonians this time around. It must have been an attempt to win the Babylonians over without fighting a battle. As the first step in a new approach, having come from being king of the Greeks, he aimed to be king of the barbarians. He had to get on terms with them. He had to show to them that he was also going to respect their own people, their own customs, their own religion. It was the first attempt to set himself up as a really international ruler. Alexander was assisted by a rumor that had spread throughout the Orient regarding his desire for tolerance and his respect for conquered populations. And the inhabitants of Babylon accepted him without difficulty. Whilst he had always previously appointed a Greek governor to head the conquered nations, in Babylon, he left the Persian governor in place, the same person who had welcomed him. Alexander left Babylon for Susa, where he seized a treasure of at least 1,500 tons of gold. Persepolis, the heart of the empire, still remained unconquered. Alexander arrived in the city in January 330 and was amazed by the Apadana Palace.
The edifice alone extends over 300 meters from east to west and 430 meters from north to south. The entire structure comprises 13 buildings. The treasury contained over 3,000 tons of gold. 20,000 mules and 3,000 camels were mobilized to remove it. Everything was gold. Bright climbed up the stairs and discovered a room of vast proportions with sumptuous cedar ceilings encrusted with precious stones. Up to 10,000 men could fit into the room. According to witnesses, Alexander penetrated the palace surrounded by his generals. However, it was alone that he approached the throne, the symbol of the power that had united so many people. Only four years had passed since he started his conquering campaign. He was 26 years old. The first political act of the new sovereign was to grant the Persians the same privileges as the Greeks. However, this conciliatory gesture was not enough to gain the trust of all the Persians. He then displayed his might and ordered the destruction of the Apadana Palace. La raison officielle qui est donnée par les Grecs, c'est qu'Alexandre a voulu venger les destructions des temples grecs par Xerxes en 480, donc euh, au cours des guerres médiques, mais certainement pas la seule raison. Ce que je crois aussi c'est que, euh, à la différence de Babylone, par exemple, ou de Suse, Alexandre n'a pas été accueilli d'une manière unanimement favorable en Perse. Il ne faut pas oublier qu'à cette date-là, Darius est toujours vivant. Il prépare une nouvelle armée euh, au nord, à Ibatan. Donc, euh, Alexandre n'est pas débarrassé de, de l'Empire perse. L'Empire perse existe toujours, même s'il a été réduit de moitié. Et, et donc, en Perse même, il y a certainement eu des résistances. Et euh, je pense que c'est, en partie en tout cas, pour faire cesser ces résistances, que Alexandre a voulu faire donner un signe, disant aux Perses, maintenant, c'est fini. La grandeur impériale, ce n'est plus le grand roi, c'est moi. Et donc, il en a détruit, non pas l'ensemble de Persepolis, d'ailleurs. On a mis le feu à un, à un palais, pas plus, hein, et on a laissé les soldats piller une partie du palais. Son intérêt était, était contradictoire. Il lui fallait à la fois euh, apparaître comme le successeur des, des grands rois, donc établir ses liens avec les nobles iraniens et les nobles perses, mais il était dans une situation où ces nobles iraniens, certains d'entre eux, n'étaient pas favorables à la collaboration. To persuade them to collaborate, Alexander simultaneously played upon feelings of fear and seduction. The Anabasis relates that he ordered an enormous banquet to which both Greeks and Persians were invited. He attended dressed in Persian dress, and in a solemn declaration, he expressed his desire to see the two peoples living in harmony. Alexandre s'est trouvé dans une situation très simple, euh, qu'avaient connu, qu connu les grands rois perses lorsqu'ils ont conquis l'Empire. C'est d'établir des relations très étroites avec euh, ceux, qui, euh, ceux qui dirigeaient l'Empire Achaemenide, c'est-à-dire la noblesse perse, iranienne, des vieilles familles, très liées entre elles, très liées à la royauté. Et il fallait absolument, Alexandre avait besoin, il y a très peu d'hommes avec lui, qui ne connaissent pas le fonctionnement de l'Empire. Il a absolument besoin du ralliement et de la collaboration de la noblesse perse et iranienne. Et pour cela, il faut qu'il qu réussisse à la fois à être le roi des Macédoniens et le roi des, le roi des Perses. Il n'a jamais pris de titre, mais peu importe. Celui qui était reconnu par les noblesse perses comme le roi. In the empire, it was customary for vassals to prostrate themselves before the king of Persia. Taking inspiration from this custom, 
Alexander invited both Greeks and Persians to follow this example. This enabled him to establish equality between his subjects and to found a natural coexistence between the Greek and Persian cultures. He therefore believed that equality had been re-established. A new era could begin between the West and the East. In common with the situation in Babylon, he left the Persian satraps in place, an eminently political move, as this approach met with the approval of most Persians. However, not all of his officers accepted this clemency towards the conquered population. Some reproached Alexander for placing an excessive importance on Persian dress, and especially for adopting it. He remained determined to persist, and a gulf started to open between him and his men. He left Persepolis for Pasigardae to visit the tomb of Cyrus the Great, a little as if he required a secret conversation with the founder of the Persian Empire, who had haunted his dreams. He then started to pursue Darius, who had fled in the company of the Bactrian satrap, Bessus. Bessus killed the Persian emperor and fled towards the east. Alexander caught up with him and, in a dramatic gesture, executed him for regicide. However, the conquest was not over. When his troops crossed the steep mountains of the Hindu Kush, they met with fierce resistance. In the regions where Persian influence was less pronounced, Alexander and his men met with violent opposition from the nomads of the steppes of Central Asia. He left behind him new cities, which included Alexandria in Arachosia, that is Kandahar, and Alexandria in the Caucasus near Kabul. He then crossed Samarkand and reached the aptly named Alexandria Ultima. He crossed the Bias River, a tributary of the Indus, the easternmost point of his immense expedition. On the other bank, the Indian subcontinent began with its tropical climate and monsoon, which the Greeks experienced for the first time. This was the place where, according to the Anabasis, an enormous Indian army had discreetly taken up position, commanded by King Porus, who Alexander then captured. How do you wish to be treated? Alexander asked him. Like a king, Porus replied. This was my intention, answered Alexander, who decided to make him a friend. The date was July 326, eight years after the start of the expedition and four years after taking Persepolis. His soldiers were weary and wished to return home. Alexander attempted to persuade them not to give up. Alexander wanted to pursue his dream up to the Great Eastern Ocean, described in the legendary tales recounted by travelers returning from China. However, the officers and soldiers remained entrenched in their positions. Alexander was disenchanted and forced to renounce his plans and turn back with his troops. Nothing could overcome his sadness for a dream that was now impossible to attain. He died three years later, on the 13th of June, 323, of a fever probably contracted in Babylon. He was not yet 33 years old. He left no will, as dreams cannot be inherited. Today, having blazed through history like a meteor, Alexander remains omnipresent throughout the East. The art of this Iranian storyteller relives the myth of the invincibility of the great conqueror. The storytellers take their sources both from memory and from universal literature that has transcended time and cultures both in the East and the West. The memory of this unique period has been handed down virtually intact over two millennia. On this bas relief, the sculptor has depicted Persians and Greeks hunting together as if to overlook the fact that they fought each other for so long. This allegory expresses the perennial vision of Alexander. The fighter on horseback from a small Greek city was propelled by a dream that was too great for his time. Alexander the Macedonian is represented not as the conqueror he actually was, but as the successor of Darius III and the Achaemenid dynasty.
The Greek world, which ten years earlier stopped at Byzantium, now stretched right up to the Indus Valley. The king of Macedonia embodied the greatest dream in history, the dream of merging the East and the West in a way other than through a clash of armies. The dream of extending the same law to all, in the same way as the sky shines its infinite light on all, ended with him, though others would pursue it. The treasures taken from the Persian kings financed the creation of major trade routes, thus accomplishing one of Alexander's aims, that of putting all people in communication with each other. This led to the creation of the Silk Road in the vast lands of Eurasia, which would link China to the Mediterranean for 23 centuries. sometimes seems that it is history dreaming through them. Started in ancient Greece, the dream of the little visionary king of Macedonia to unite the East and the West remains unfulfilled. Then the rear ranks hold theirs diagonally into the air until uh, the person in front is killed and then, the, then they will move forward and lower their sarissa. Well, it was strong because the enemy were faced with a whole hedge of, of bristling points in the forward section of the, uh, of the phalanx. So that was very intimidating to the enemy and very deadly if they had no gaps occurring in the line. Its professional infantry, sarissas, and complete mastery of a new combat strategy, Alexander had a decisive military device at his disposal. All that remained was to embark on a campaign. This mosaic represents the young Alexander about to attack a lion. As an adolescent, he apparently managed to single-handedly tame Bucephalus, a wild horse that, along with Alexander, would become legendary. The philosopher Aristotle was responsible for teaching him the unique Greek way of thinking that had been developed that he had learned about. His intuition was that the Persian Empire depended on something other than mere force. Tomris Bakir is heading the dig at the Turkish site of Daskilium, the seat of the Persian government in the region. She believes that it was probably here that Alexander discovered the existence of a new system the Persians used for communications and exchanges. It was an extensive network linking the entire region to Persepolis, the capital of the empire. The system was based on the use of a seal affixed to letters to seal them and authenticate the sender. Several hundred seals were found in the ruins of Daskilium. Burada yapılan kazılarda ele geçen 500 adet bulla, yani mühür baskısı, Daskilion'un İran'daki merkez Persepolis'le olan bağlantısını gösteriyor. This technique is still used in Iran, in the desert province of Yazdi. 2,400 kilometers to the east of the Egyptian site. The top of the well is perfectly visible. The underground sources run along these canats.
The canal is designed on a slight slope to enable the water to be distributed over the greatest area possible. It was a gigantic hydraulic system with a series of wells that linked underground canals running from the mountains to the farms in the plain. If they had no gaps occurring in the mine. With its professional infantry, sarissas, and complete mastery of a new combat strategy, Alexander had a decisive military device at his disposal. All that remained was to embark on a campaign. This mosaic represents the young Alexander about to attack a lion. As an adolescent, he apparently managed to single-handedly tame Bucephalus, a wild horse that, along with Alexander, would become legendary. The philosopher Aristotle was responsible for teaching him the unique Greek way of thinking that had been developing intellectually for over three centuries. For the Greeks, the entire world was limited to Greece, Egypt, and Asia at whose borders India was located. Alexander was convinced that he had to spread the same way of thinking to all habitable lands and to all fellow citizens of the same state and government. In a word, he felt he was responsible for taking Greek civilization to the most remote lands. Before embarking on this enterprise, he decided to consolidate his power inherited from his father he united around him the Greek cities being threatened by Persian expansionism and weakened by divisions. These cities were also scattered over a large area and were therefore vulnerable. Convinced by his vision, these cities entrusted him to liberate their sister cities in Asia Minor, which at that time was under Persian rule. During this period in history, the majority of Asia was under the influence of the powerful Persian Empire. In keeping with this vast territory, everything was on a gigantic scale. This statue representing Lamassu, a winged bull with a man's head, is seven meters tall. It appears to guard Persepolis, the capital of the empire, a place that was the subject of both fear and fascination for the small Greek cities. This monumental staircase leading up to Apadana Palace is also impressive and was large enough to accommodate 100,000 people, without including the 10,000 immortals that formed the imperial guard of the sovereign. The system of government was an autocratic one, very different from democratic Greece. Darius III, an absolute monarch, and the king of kings, ruled over his empire with an iron fist. His power lay in the richness of his vassals, the 23 provinces of the Persian Empire. These included the Scythians, formidable nomad warriors that formed his cavalry. India supplied his gold. Ethiopia, his ivory. The Persian Empire still had to conquer Greece, which it had always coveted and was a real obsession for Darius. The Persians had twice unsuccessfully.